Good morning. I want to welcome you out to Haven Rock Church live stream. It's an honor for you to join us and worship with us this morning. We're going to get started in just a few minutes with the sermon, but I want to give a special thanks and also get some announcements. Special thanks uh, to Jacqueline Davis, who worked so hard on not just the live stream, but all the videos that we're sending out uh, during this time. And she's doing a great job. So if you get a chance to hit up the social media on Carriager, give her a big shout out because she's doing an amazing job. Also, Jim Azuku, who also, he's instrumental in us being able to do this. He works so hard behind the scenes always. Uh, we're going to pray in just a minute. A couple of announcements, too. After the sermon, we do this even when we meet live. We, we have small groups after our sermons. That's also true visual, virtually. So after our sermon today, we're going to have our small groups. And so on the screen before you, are some times and links to the small groups. Now, if you're going to connect by phone, you've got to download the Zoom app if you don't have it. And once you download the app, it's as simple as clicking on the link and you're right there with the group. If you are going to, to, to try to connect with the computer, you probably want to sign up for Zoom and then put the link in. Sign up is free and it's that simple. And you can, you can hook up and we can have these small groups that we have after church on Sunday and also on Wednesdays of our midweek. Okay, that sound good? Let's pray and then we'll hop into the message. Dearly Father, God, thank you so much for all that you do for us. Thank you for your love and your grace and your goodness. Thank you that we've made it another Sunday. There's so much going on in the world. And we give a special prayer to the leaders of the and all the nations to God that you give them wisdom a special thanks and prayer to all the doctors and nurses and frontline people who are serving in amazing ways right now, that you bless them and protect them and their families. Dear God, that you, we, we thank you for protecting our families. We pray for protection, for healing for those who are sick. A special prayer for Michelle's mom who's in the hospital right now, uh, that she recovers, dear God, is at full strength. And for all of our families, dear God. Uh, we have sick in the church. We pray for Jacqueline, uh, dear God, for her health, dear God, and her strength, dear God, we pray. For Ori Mack and for and for and for Walter Martin, the God that you watch with Miss Perrine during this time. We pray all this in your name and through your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So what we're going to talk about this morning is facing the life. As I prayed about what we could discuss, I couldn't think of a better message because God knows the coronavirus is a Goliath in our lives. It's a big deal. Right, it's it's a problem. It's scary. It's standing in our way, in much the same way Goliath was that for the nation of Israel. So I thought that was a great passage to study this morning because there are lessons there that definitely apply to us. So let's look at a few things about facing Goliath. First thing to know about Goliath is real simple. Goliath was big. Okay, and a little background: the Philistines and Israel they were at war. And so they had an impasse at the war, and you know, and, and they're the, there, and you had the, the, the nation of Israel and their armies on one side of a ravine, and the nations of the Philistines and their armies on the other side, and they're just daring each other. You know, there's a low battle, and they're waiting for the first army to cross, right? So Goliath started appearing each day and saying, Look, let's not fight. You send your champion to fight me. Winner takes all. Okay, I'm a man. You send your best man, and we'll fight. And whoever wins, their army won the war. Now, look, there's no way the Philistines are going to go through with that or, or Israel. But just the fact this guy was challenging Israel that way and daring any of the men to face their champion, Goliath. Now, man, there were seasoned warriors in Israel. And Saul, the king of Israel himself, was a, was a man of good size, a head taller than the rest of Israel, and a proven warrior. But there was no warrior willing to take the risk of fighting Goliath. Now, why was that? Because he was big and he was tough. The Bible says that he was over nine feet tall. To give you some perspective, Shaquille O'Neal, one of the biggest men on the planet, is like 7'2", right? Goliath was nearly two feet bigger taller than Shaquille O'Neal. It says just the, the tip of his iron spear was 15 pounds. 
that his armor that he wore weighed 125 pounds. In other words, he wore a person for his armor. He was a bad man, a big man, a strong man. And this is not today. Like, you know, a big man could come to you and challenge you today. But guess what? A Glock would even that up, right? This is a different era, right? There were no guns back in the old days. The advantage of being big was a huge advantage back before the age of guns and, and all that stuff. And so there was no one willing to challenge Goliath. He was a real threat. And the fear of them, the fear of him was for good reason, right? It's the same way today. We have challenges in our lives where those challenges are real. They're not imaginary. And they're huge. And the fear and the anxiety that we have is for good reason. Right? And whether that's personal illness, financial problems, maybe financial problems caused by coronavirus. You know, concern about family members that, you know, whether they'll get the virus or not. Whether it's our job situation here again because of the, the economy and things going on. Whatever the situation. Maybe it's marital problems. Addictions. Sexual addiction, addiction to drugs. Maybe there's a sin that's dark on our feet. We all have Goliaths in our lives. Different Goliaths at different times. But you know, size is a funny thing because size sometimes is about perspective. You know, I'm I'm a relatively short person. I'm five foot seven for a guy. That's that's below average, right? But when I go to family reunions on the hunt family side. I'm pretty big, you know, five foot seven, we're a family of midgets. So five foot seven is a pretty good size, right? I tell you what, I love basketball. Now, basketball doesn't always love me. I'm not, I'm not the best player in the world. Started playing basketball fairly late in life, right? But I tell you what, I lived in, in Zimbabwe for about a year as a missionary. And in the country of Zimbabwe, I was a much better basketball player. Now, why was that? Because my best moves. Oh, like post moves. You know, I, I had a little like Charles Barkley game where I back you down and I spin over and shoot that little jumper. And it was like, man, money, right? Now, that worked in Zimbabwe because most people were shorter than I was. And the ones that weren't shorter than me were much thinner than I was, right? And, and I was pretty thin back then, but they were thinner than me. So I backed them down Charles Barkley style. If you never saw Barkley play, YouTube it. The man was a bad man, okay? And I back him down, I shoot my little, my little thing, and I was, I was the man, I was like, I had game all of a sudden in Zimbabwe, because I could make my little move. And then I moved back to the States. And you can't be backing guys down at five foot seven. The guys are like, you better get out of here. They're blocking my shot, and I'm, I gotta go up with the guards, right? I got to shoot some jumpers up. I'll beat him off the dribble or something. I didn't have no, I didn't have a handle, so that wasn't working. But it changed. Look, in Zimbabwe, I was good size. And, you know, what's that have to do with our message today? Well, I love basketball and that's something. But it has to do with this, though. Everyone saw Goliath's height, how big he was. But David, the man of God, didn't quite see Goliath the same way as everyone else. His perspective was different because he saw Goliath through faith rather than fear. And so David hears all the rumblings. He goes to visit his brothers who were fighting in the war. And he goes there and hears all the rumbling of Goliath and hears him threatening the armies of Israel. And hears as a reward from the king of Israel for any Israelite who would go and fight Goliath and win. And no one's going to take that chance because they said, we can't beat him. So what good is a reward if you're dead, right? How can you reward a dead man? So David comes on the scene and he says this to the king over in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And we'll start reading in verse 32. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion 
or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. I mean, Saul was amazed because David was like, I'm not worried about how big this guy is. He's not big to me. Now, why was that? He said, because I know my God has done amazing things in my life. And I can't forget what God has done. He's done miracle after miracle. And my God, he rescued me when I didn't have any rent money, but the rent came. Well, I should have lost, lost my life, but my life was spared. The God that's been good to you so many times, he's not going to forget me now. That was David's mentality. He rescued me from a lion and a bear. I know he's going to rescue me from this current situation. I remember what he's done. I know the bigness of my God. And so he may seem big. So Goliath may seem big compared to you. The God who rescued me from the, the lion and the bear will rescue me from Goliath as well. Wow. You know, I think about this and I think about my own life. My family has been through hard times. We're going through some hard times. You know, two, the two hardest situations of my life had been my mom getting dementia in 2011 and, and being with her and, and being her primary caretakers from 2011 until she passed away in 2016. And that was the hardest thing, to see her lose herself a little bit each day. And basically, you're burying part of your mom each day. Man, what a, that was hard, overwhelming. But even harder than that was my oldest daughter, Jacqueline, getting sick with a mysterious illness when she was 14. And so for 14 years now, she's been sick. And, you know, I mean, the hardest part was when she was very, very ill, uh, about five years into it, and was hospitalized for six weeks. And we really didn't know for the first three or four weeks, uh, she, was, she was in a catatonic state. They couldn't get her out of it for a couple of weeks. And we really didn't know that she was gonna live or die. Man, what a helpless feeling as a parent. What a terrible feeling. They feel so helpless. My mom's illness and my daughter's illness, those are the Goliaths of my life. And even now, watching my, my daughter struggle for the health, it's, such, not, it's a Goliath for her, but as a parent, it is for us as well. What a challenge. But it's a funny thing about that. These are the hardest challenges in my life, and I've had other challenges, but man, this, these are like the Goliaths, right? I've had my bad days with them. I've had my nights where I just cried and, and or, or going out to the deck and just cry out to God. Say, God, why is this happening? God, help us, right? But the truth of the matter is, my faith has been far stronger with these challenges than I was with past challenges. See, why is that? Because the truth of the matter is, I've been able to draw on the lion and the bear. Now, bear with me here. You know, back in 1992, I got ill. I just come back from Africa and I came back with, I came back with a mysterious illness that made me bedridden. And I was very, very sick. And I mean, I was sick to the point that people thought I was going to die. And I started a journey of, of my own illness, right? Undiagnosed is this traumatic thing. And I was so depressed and so scared and so bitter that at the age of 27, my life had stopped. And my future was in jeopardy. And the scariest thing for me was not the, the idea that I might die, but the idea that I would live and maybe be bedridden for the rest of my life. That was a scariest concept. And let me tell you, I didn't handle it well. I wasn't some spiritual hero through that ordeal, man. I, I got, I was down, I was depressed. I was angry at God. I was bitter toward people. You, you know when you're mad at God? when you're mad at everyone around you. Because most of us have the sense not, not to be mad, not, not to say to God I'm mad or not that I hate you, God, but it made me bitter toward everyone around me because it, in my heart, 
down deep. I was so angry at God. How could I sacrifice and be a missionary in Africa for two years and do everything I've done for you, God? How can you do this to me? How can I suffer like this? How could you forget me? You know, for years, even after things got better, I preached about my illness as the Goliath in my life. But it wasn't. Good people helped me get through it. And one sister in particular, uh, Donna Cunningham, who was the only person I knew at the time sicker than me, she was dying. And uh, she would reach out to me from her bed, deathbed, and she was all bones at that point. And she would call me and say, Frank, what can I do for you? How can I, how can I help you? What can I pray for you about? And it was so humbling, man. It was so, here I am bitter and angry. And the sister who was using her, life, his, her last breaths, her last bit of strength to reach out to me, I, I can't tell you. I think about it every time. I, I, I want to cry every time I think of her. When I see her in heaven, I'm going to give her a big hug because her reaching out to me was a turning point in my spiritual life to help me get back on track and, and start to be grateful for what I had and what I could do and trust God. But it was a journey. And I'd fall into a dark place. Didn't handle it well. And so, so when I got better spiritually and then got better physically, I would, I would preach about that time, that first year and a half of being sick as my Goliath, right? But it wasn't. What I didn't know then is my illness was the lion or the bear. I didn't know then that I was going to have a daughter who would be sick. That I was going to have my mom get dementia. That there would be bigger things emotionally than my illness. I didn't know at the time that God was preparing me. Now get this. Preparing my faith to be strong enough to handle something bigger and something more. And give glory to him through it. I, I couldn't have known that, that my illness was a training camp for a bunch of other challenges that would happen in my life. you believe that? There's nothing. I said it before. There's no virus. There's no, there's no person. There's no circumstance bigger than your God. He's got you. you hear me say that a lot in the next few weeks. He's got you. If you will, someone turn to them and say it. He's got you. No matter what your circumstance, God is enough. He's enough. A couple more scriptures. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7. It simply says, we walk by faith, not by sight. Hebrews 11, verse 6. Simply reads, that without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. God exists, we gotta believe it, but God rewards those who pursue him. Are you pursuing God today? If you're pursuing God, he says, you gotta trust that I will bless you. Are you pursuing me? You're being faithful to me? You've gotta trust that I will turn the hardship into blessing. And that my blessing is bigger than your challenge. My promise is bigger than your problem. You're pursuing me. I'm pursuing you. And what's happening is happening for a reason. And I'm telling you, trust in me, it will work out for your good. Because I slew the lion. I slew the bear. And I will slay the lion. Are you trusting God this morning? Is your faith in God this morning? We all have bad days. We all have days where we forget. Remember. I want to encourage you today to remember. And when you remember, and you remember the size of your God, you turn to your brother or sister and you remind them as well. Because this storm will pass. And unfortunately, after this one passes, another one will come. But you know who will always stay the same? It's the Lord our God. Let's trust in God. Let's spread love. In fact, let's spread faith, hope, and love. And we'll see glorious things ahead. And the God be the glory. Amen. That concludes the sermon. Please connect with the small groups.
and we'll take communion in those groups. Let's pray to close out the service. God, thank you for, for your word. It's your word, not mine. Thank you for your spirit. May God help us to embrace your spirit and feel your arms and wrap around us to God. Drive away our fears. Open our eyes that we can see that you are so big and compared to you, our problems are so small. We pray all this in your name and through your son, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.